One of my favorite authors, speakers, Tony Robbins says, you simply need to raise your standards. And my best friend, Casey Tchuhake, calls me every week, says, raise your standards. We got to raise our standards because sometimes we have to turn the things we should do into the things that we must do. And that's what we're talking about today is raising our standards. And we're going Mach 1. But first, let's bring in the show. This is the Entrepreneur Underdog, business secrets to help doubted entrepreneurs triumph. The Underdog Entrepreneur is where we use fast-acting shortcuts to help underdog entrepreneurs make more money, have a bigger impact, and live a better lifestyle so that they can prove their haters wrong. And now, your host, Roy Red. Roy Red. Yo, what's up, everybody? It's your boy, Roy Red, five-time best-selling author, internationally recognized speaker, and your host of this show, The Entrepreneur Underdog, where we share fast-acting shortcut strategies and tactics to help underdog entrepreneurs win in life and business so they can prove their haters wrong, but in a positive way. Today, I'm super excited. We are talking to Paul White, and he's going to teach us how to raise our standards flat out. Thank you guys for tuning in live. Make sure if you're on YouTube, you comment, share, and like. That'll be on the right side. If you're on LinkedIn or Facebook, that'll be below. And there's the prompt. Make sure you share, follow, and all that good stuff. And we already have people tuning in. What's up, Pops? That's my Pops right there. Uh, Also, Uncle Ron. Thanks. I appreciate it. uh, You for tuning in. Paul, how you doing, man? I'm doing good, bud. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Uh, thanks for coming on, um, and also thank you for kind of molding. You know, I was running a little late today. For the few people on the call who don't know who you are, who is Paul White? Uh, what have you done, and uh, what are you doing today? That's a really interesting way that you framed that question because mm-hmm. I was tossing up some things the other day with some guys around the around the shop, and mm-hmm. we got off talking about who you are versus what you do. And I, I think that that's a unique way to frame that. So who am I? I'm a husband. I'm a father. I'm a protector and a provider of my family. What I do is I try to help people become better versions of themselves one step at a time. I got a history of being in the military. I was I was I did that for 21 years. I've gotten the opportunity to coached some sports at a a fairly good level, uh, won a couple of championships, had some good times with that, learned a lot of really good life lessons that apply to a lot of, a lot of different uh, areas, be it business or life in general, or obviously sports and, and just raising your standard, like you said. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I want to flat out just say thank you for your service. I really appreciate you creating a blanket so that uh, I can, I can be free. So thank you for that. Thanks, man. Appreciate you. Uh Uh-huh. Uh, I want to jump right into it. What is the one to five project? I was reading up on that. What is that and what inspired you to create that? So it's the one of five project just to be, uh, you know, words mean things. So it's the one of five project and it stems from, excuse me, it stems from Jim Rohn's quote, you're the average of the five people that you spend the most time with. And Mm -hmm. as soon as I say that to someone, usually they start thinking about the five people that they hang out with the most. And I kind of wanted to flip the script on it just a little bit. While it's important to know who you're surrounded by and how those people influence you, I want people to look at it from the position of being one of the five people because you are part of somebody's circle, you know, whether it's the people who influence you or, you know, somebody you influence some way. And if we take a, if we take that point of view on it, then we realize that there are a lot of people around us, whether it's a small circle, big circle, doesn't matter. There are people who are looking at us for inspiration and influence. And I think if we just, it's, it is, it's a little bit selfish. I'll give you that, but it's all about the individual. It's all about me. And if I can just make myself a better version of me every day, then eventually that's going to inspire somebody to want to elevate. Yeah. Yeah. That's huge. And, and that's what takes us into the importance of raising your standards because what I've noticed is anytime I level up, everyone around me levels up. Um, of course. Quick story, background story is I work out every day. I want to be chiseled. I want to be strong. I like. I really take fitness serious. And when my dad was a kid, there was a gentleman who lived across the street who was very, you know, chiseled and he walked tall. And my dad saw that and got inspired. And now today, my dad's a trainer 
in tune, which motivated me to really be into fitness. So what you talked about there is who are you inspiring and who are you leading is rings like very true to me. So talk about the importance of raising your standards and how that, in my opinion, is is the best way to be a leader. Yeah, well, I mean, not only is it self-fulfilling, I mean, you get to you get to enjoy the wins and, and you get to enjoy the accomplishment of reaching your own goals. But I think it's more fun when you get to see somebody else reach outside of their comfort zone and, and, and get themselves a win. And, and I have a story as well. I'll share it with you real quick. My wife, um, I'd been on my personal journey for about two to two and a half years or so. I'm, I'm, I'm into fitness, I'm, um, uh, both physical and mental. I mean, even spiritual, I, I try to maintain a pretty good balance for the most part. Uh, and it, about two years went by and, and my wife finally stopped me on the way out of the room. And, and she says, Hey, I don't know what you're doing back there, but I got to get some of that. So she started her personal journey and she quit smoking and she's really cut down on, on a lot of her, I would call them negative habits and replaced them with very good positive habits. And the proof really came out um, back around the 1st of January, she pushed out of her comfort zone and she signed up for a Tough Mudder race with me. Yeah. And so uh, a couple of weekends ago, she and I went down, or we're down here in Phoenix, we went down and we ran a 5K Tough Mudder. And she had a little bit of self-doubt uh, in the beginning, but she set a goal. She says, I'm gonna jog until the first obstacle. And yeah. she jogged further than she's jogged in probably 20 years. She jogged almost a full mile without stopping and made it to the first obstacle. And to watch her confidence grow from obstacle one to obstacle obstacle 25 was just, I mean, that was me just sitting back there having kind of this proud dad moment of watching her bust out of her shell. And just, it seemed like we walked away from that. By the time we got to the car, she kind of had this, this attitude of I can do anything. And, and mm -hmm. that to me, when, when you elevate your game, your personal game, to a point where you're influence other people to push that far and do that to themselves, that's the payoff. Cause you know, it's working at that point. Yeah. Yeah. That's huge. And you know, us that play sports or people that are in the military, we kind of learned how to work through struggle and all that stuff, but all the good stuff's on the other side of struggle, not just, you know, oh, yeah. transforming your body, but it's just the <clears throat> mind state of what, it can do for you. And if you're going to raise your standards, you're going to go through struggle. So talk about maybe a time that you struggle, maybe a time in the military or a time in life where you were just up against it and explain to us, kind of give the context and the story around it. And then explain to us what pulled you through that or pushed you through it. Yeah. You know, I tend to kind of tell the same stories over and over, but I, I'm going to pick a different one for this one. I haven't told this story very much to, to a lot of people. So uh, I got into coaching, oh gosh, about seven or eight years ago, um, coaching football when my kids were were growing up. And I I kind of got pushed into coaching football. And, and I'm the kind of guy, man, probably a lot like yourself, that when I commit to something, man, I'm going in it. I, I'm just jumping in with both feet. And and I am 100% committed. My, my wife called herself a football widow for about seven years. Um <laughs> But that first season, that the first season, you know, I think a lot of us fall into this trap where we sit around on Saturdays and Sundays and we watch football and we think we know X's and O's and we kind of gripe and complain about what the coaches are doing and why did he do that? Why did he make that call? That was dumb, you know? And um, I learned a lot that first season. When I joined up, I was the fifth assistant coach. By the first game, two of them had quit and then the rest of them just kind of bailed. And twice that season out of seven games, two games that season, I was the only coach on the sideline yeah. uh, during a game. I'm over there and I'm trying to keep track of minimum plays for players. I'm trying to call offense and defense and argue with referees and, you know, simmer the the parents down and all this stuff. And, and we ended up finishing that season two and five. It was not good. It was just, yeah. I mean, it was coaches, players, um, parents, everybody had a very, they did not have fun that season for sure, which is a huge goal in youth sports, especially. So we moved down to Phoenix and I, I never really considered coaching again. I thought, well, you know, maybe that's just not my calling. I don't know. I, I, I enjoy being out there with the kids, but we didn't get out of it what we thought we were going to get out of it. Right. Well, I got talked into doing it again mm -hmm. and no kidding, man, true story. I show up to, I show up to the second practice. The first practice is the practice that I got asked to come and help. And the second practice I show up and I'm the only coach again. Well, Hey, guess what? I've seen this movie before. 
and I know how it ends. So I'm going to change the script a little bit. Right. Yeah. So I took a different approach because I was disciplined about note taking and I'm a student and, and I had really honed in on some of the fundamentals of how to teach and how to coach and how to communicate that season, we ended up going nine and oh, and we won a championship. Wow. So, so that was, that was, I mean, and, and I'm not trying to brag and, and, and boast or anything, but I'm saying that the process of upping your game and upping your standard are those little things. It's just little, it's, it's the smallest little things that you would think of, like taking notes on an abysmal season that was a complete failure by a lot of accounts mm -hmm. and learning lessons from those, applying them to the next iteration. And now you can, I mean, I can look back, I can look over my corner right now and see a four foot trophy that reminds me if I can apply my lessons learned from a failure, then I can turn that into a success. Yeah. Yeah. That's huge. And you took the failure, turned into a success, became champions, which leads me to my next question is what does it mean to be a champion of your own life? And after you kind of describe what that means to you, um, how do we hone into that? How do we take tangible, actionable steps, step one through five, whatever that is to be the yeah. champion in our own life or the hero of our story? Yeah. Well, you know, and the great thing, man, is, um, everybody has to define success and success yeah. means something a little bit different to everyone. And me personally, I don't think success is a destination. I think success is a journey. All right. Now you can define it however you want to, whether it's a monetary goal or, or whatever, but then I will question somebody that says, you know, I want to make a million dollars. All right, cool. Um, what happens when you make a million dollars? Are you going to stop? Or are you going to keep going? So, so that's why I say for me personally, it's a journey. All right. Now, stepping back, how do you get there from here? All right. Well, one of the things, one of the things that we teach is I teach the three P's. This is just something that I came up with based on years of, of teaching on, on people, how to win at different things. And I say, plan, posture, perform, all right. Yeah. Or plan. Yeah. Plan, posture, perform. Before we get into those three things, though, I think there's a really important step and it's goal setting. Uh, you have to be able to set a target out there to aim for. You, you wouldn't just go out and jump in your car and start driving around with no destination. You, you end up driving around town and you get nowhere. Right. Yeah. So your life really isn't that much different. So if you set a goal, if you set a destination out there, now you have an aim point. And when you reverse engineer that just a little bit and you start working from that target backwards, you find these intermediate milestones, these intermediate targets that you can knock down and get to. That's where you get into the planning phase. So once you start to plan, you plan to reach the first target with your goal in mind. You, you can't focus on the goal necessarily, the, the, the end result. You focus on what's right in front of you. The closest alligator to the boat. We, we always say kill the closest alligator to the boat. I know I got to get across the lake but I got to kill the closest alligator of the boat first. Right? Mm -hmm. So in the planning process, I'm just lining everything up. I'm, I'm figuring out the details of, of how I need to get there and what it needs to be. And then I move into the posture phase and that's where I'm just gathering the resources that I need to be able to execute that plan. Eventually, if, if my goal is to lose 10 pounds by the high school reunion, that's coming up in a few months, well, I might need to go get a gym membership or buy some new running shoes or get my camel back or, you know, make sure my playlist are right or, or whatever it is, empty my pantry of all the bad crap that's in there and buy some broccoli you know, junk like that. Once I've got everything postured, my chessboard is set up the way that I want it. Now I just start, I just start killing those alligators, man. Mm -hmm. And that's the performance phase. I just start going through and knocking those things down one at a time. I use the analogy of, have you seen those big domino competitions where they line up like a thousand dominoes out there and they flick yeah. one and then like a flower blooms or something like that. Yeah, that's yeah. kind of the analogy that I use with people is I say, man, you, you got to spend a lot of time setting up those dominoes. You know, it takes a while to plan out where all the dominoes need to be. And then you got to find the right dominoes and you got to set up the right dominoes. Once you start knocking them down, it's really not that hard. You just knock down the next one that's in line. Yeah. Yeah, that's huge. We, we on this show, we call that chunking. Chunking. Yeah, same. Yeah, the next same thing. Actionable steps, you mm -hmm. know, and, and that's super huge. Uh, really quick, a lot of people hopped on the call. So we want to say hello to them. Make sure you guys ask questions or comment and share. That'll be on the right side. If you're on YouTube, that'll be below. If you are anywhere else, who do we have on here? We got Ron. He's saying Roy really enjoying the show. Ron also says uh, his bio is nice. Uh, that's awesome. That's awesome. So I have a Marine here who asked me a question he wanted to ask you. And I guess we got to give some context on what this means after we ask it. But um. He said, how do you deal with blue falcons in your life? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so um, 
gosh, I'm trying to think of a PC way to, to frame that <laughs> blue Falcon. Um, I'll say, l- let me see if I can frame it this way. A, a blue Falcon would be somebody who is trying to undermine you at every turn. All right. Yeah. And, and maybe, maybe off camera, I can explain a little bit more about what that is, but, um, for the Marine, uh, fortunately for you, buddy, I, I speak a little hoorah. Uh, my father-in-law is a Marine. So, so I've been kind of indoctrinated to that a little bit, but, um, I think again, I, and I'll go back to my project, my, my one of five project. I, I can't control what anybody else does. You know, haters going to hate man. Yeah. And when a lot of times when people see success, they look at themselves in the mirror and their way of projecting their insecurities and their flaws is going to be to outwardly project that onto you and try to bring you back down to their level. Well, don't let them bring you back down to their level. You just keep rising up, man. And if they don't want to come along on the ride, that's on them. You got to control what you can control. And right now, the only person that I can control is the guy that stands, stares back at me in the mirror every night. Yeah. Yeah. That's super huge. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, we have one more question. Let me see if I can find it here. Um, bum, 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 bum. We'll come back to that one. I got to scroll through. There's a bunch of comments. <clears throat> um, you have a process, which I just love the simplicity of it. And I'm all about you know, winning. Um, I hate to lose. Um, what is the winning process? And what is your winning process when you go into something, for example, when you took those kids or if you're going into uh, anything that you're doing in life, what is your winning process so that you can recreate winning over and over again? Yeah, well, what we just talked about, the three P's, as I call them, the, the plan, mm-hmm. posture, perform, that's that's a huge piece of it. And that's yeah. that's probably in, you know, at its, at its most basic form, that's probably really it. And and I would break that down like we, we used to break down our missions. Mm-hmm. into plan, brief, execute, debrief. Um, so again, something very simple. And, and you know, but coming from the military, um, I'm very process oriented. Um, yeah. And I think that process, if you can, if you find a process that works for you and you have the discipline to execute that process, then then I think you're, I think you're doing good. And, and for me, it's plan, execute, debrief, right? So plan everything out in detail. And if you can plan better than the other guy, then I think right then you're just, you're, you're heads and tails above them. Right. And then the execution phase takes care of itself. And as you execute, you're, you're kind of, you're kind of doing this assessment at every phase, you know? So if you look at it as a football game, right, we call a play, we break the huddle, we go up to the line of scrimmage. Mm -hmm. If the defense doesn't match the offense that we just called, well, we got to, we're either going to live with the call that we made and deal with the repercussions. And now we're going to be second and 15, or we're going to call a smart audible. And the, um, the games that you're playing in your life, the, the, the strategies that you're using in your life or your business or, or your relationships, it's not really that different. You know, if you go and you call a play in your business and, and you notice right away that, you know, the cards are stacked against you or, or the enemy gets a vote kind of thing. And, and, and it's just lining up to where it looks like it's just not going to work. Well, then call a smart audible. And there's a whole, there's a whole, uh, tree, um, that I could go down about, did you call an audible? Yes or no. If yes, did it work? If no, why not? You know, all these things. And, and you just kind of keep asking yourself those questions. And eventually you get to, you get to a point when you, when you keep dissecting at that, and we talk about peeling back the onion, when you peel back the onion far enough, you get to the middle of it to where the actual root cause is. And yeah. once you can identify that root cause of why it went wrong, you write that stuff down in a journal and you don't do that crap anymore. You know, if I know that the outside linebacker is blowing up my my uh my sweep to the right and my right tackle can't get out there to block him well guess what man i'm either going to audible out of it or i'm just not going to run that play anymore i'll run to the left i'll 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 eliminate that dude from the game yeah so if you take if you can i got a chapter in my book coming up i I got a book coming out here not shameless plug i got a a book coming out called work hard don't suck and it's short little reads uh it's advice to my kids as they're getting ready to go out into adulthood and one of the chapters in that book is everything you need to know from life you can learn from the game of football and I really believe that, man. There's so much that you can learn from sports that translate into your everyday life. I don't care if you're going to pick your kids up from school or fixing your coffee in the morning. You can take these lessons that I learned from coaching a whole bunch of football. And a lot of it's the intangible stuff, the stuff that doesn't even take any talent, like showing up yeah. on time and being prepared and and giving effort, you know, things like that, that it's just innate, it's character traits. It's not talent-based. Yeah, yeah, that's super huge. Ron wants to ask, he said... Paul, oh, you can't really see it there. Let me put it on this screen. 
He said, Paul, what do you say to someone who has trouble overcoming their own limiting conversations? Yes, this is good. So let me introduce, uh, I'm going to introduce for the first time a character that I invented and his name is Stan. All right. Uh, to anyone named Stan, this is not a slight on you, I promise. This is just my character name for the voice inside my head that's trying to talk me out of things, right? I, I got, at any given time, generally speaking, most people have two voices in their head. They, they have their boss voice, and then they have that other voice that I call, it's your inner quitter. And that voice, that's, that's the Stan voice. And Stan is generally unmotivated. He's generally undisciplined. He likes to sit around. He's all about your feelings. You know, he, do, he doesn't want you to go out and aspire to be anything great because, man, that takes a lot of hard work and hard work kind of sucks. And it's cold outside and windy. You don't need to go on that run. And man, I mean, there's snow in the parking lot at the gym. You don't want to go to the gym and get your shoes all wet. That's Stan talking to you. And on the flip side of that is your champion's voice. And that's Jack, right? Jack is QB1, six pack abs, got the hot chick, drives a cool car right? Yeah. You want to be Jack. You want to listen to your inner champion because your inner champion is the disciplined guy that says, no, no, no. My process says I go to the gym today. I, it doesn't matter if it snowed last night. It doesn't matter if I'm tired or I didn't get a lot of sleep last night or if my schedule's full. My process says go to the gym. I go to the gym. That's called discipline. You do what you need to do, when you need to do it, how it's supposed to be done, and you do it like that every time. Yeah, that's super huge. It's um, It's pretty cool how you framed it that way because you know one of the steps I took with my athletes uh one major NBA player that everyone would know um uh, that a, a few people know that I worked with is we we built this kind of this character for him and then he was able to step out of himself and be the character and it's yes. just something super powerful it's almost like it's almost like acting but it's not you embody uh this character <clears throat> So I super, super duper love that. Well, it, uh, right. Not only that, but to, mm -hmm. to get to to get to the actual question and 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 the answer to the question is mm -hmm. you got to learn to tell Jack to shut up or uh, Stan to shut up. Yeah. Like yeah. He's trying to talk you out of all this stuff. And you got no Stan. I don't want to be that guy. I don't want to yeah. be Stan. I want to be Jack. And Jack's telling me to go. So I have these conversations with myself every single day and, and my tactic, and this is just me, but I call mm -hmm. myself all sorts of names. Like I get, <laughs> I go dark. I go dark sometimes. <laughs> me too, I'll, me. I'll call myself some names that, that let's not say on, on air here, but yeah. that motivates me. And that's me talking to Stan. It gives me, it gives me a point of reference. It gives me somebody that I can yell at. Mm -hmm. and it's all going on inside my head, but I, now I sound like a lunatic, but that's how I cope with it. That's how I move through and and I execute the discipline things that I need to do every day. Yeah, yeah. Um, I kind of want to talk about the book. I would love to have you on again when you launch the book. Yeah, but sure. What inspired you to write the book? And we we talk about um, writing books here. I, I believe it's yeah. a, a good way to leave a legacy for people to always be able to see how you saw the world. Um, and how did it did it change you at all writing the book? What did you learn from writing the book and kind of that process? So the the genesis of the book came, and I'm going to take it all the way back to Father's Day a couple of years ago mm -hmm. when uh, that was the first time in 25-ish years that none of my kids called, texted, or said, Happy Father's Day. And, you know, as a military guy, we miss a lot of these quote-unquote special days. Mm -hmm. So usually that kind of stuff doesn't bother me but for whatever reason this one stung a little bit i called a family meeting i had just gotten finished reading extreme ownership by jocko willink yeah. and i did some really good inspection on myself that day and and i took ownership of it because as the protective provider of my family i had kind of let the family diverge just a little bit my kids were older they are they're, they're starting to go and hang out with their friends more they're they're holed up in their room or whatever and so I brought back family, you know, family game night or family movie night or whatever it was, you know, once every couple of weeks, just to give us an excuse to be in the same room together. Yeah. It was about that same time. Just, just a few months later, I realized my wife and I were sitting in the living room and I realized that we were done raising our kids. Our kids were, they're old enough to take in, they're old enough to, to take care of themselves, get themselves where they need to go. Yeah. I mean, we taught them to be good dudes. I think they're good dudes. Right. So as a last hail Mary, of giving them the dad advice that I've been giving them for all these years, I decided to put together this book. And my idea was to write down all the dad advice and write one eight and a half by 11 page on what that meant 
For example, one of the quotes in our house or one of the things that we've always used in our house is just be a good dude. And I wanted to write out what that meant to me and how they can apply it to their lives. Yeah. I ended up with 160 of these topics. So way too much for one book, right? That would have been like a three, 400 page book. So I broke it down. I chose 60 of them and that's going to be volume one of work hard. Don't suck. And it's coming out. Uh, my target is April 1st. I think realistically it's probably going to be about April 15th, but, but April 1st is my target. Um, it's an edit phase right now. So we're going to get that out. And it's, it's meant to be short reads. Um, you know, a few minutes, maybe five minutes per section or per chapter, there's 60 of them in there. And it spans everything from character to mentality, to discipline, to, uh, financial responsibility to, there's just some bonus material in there. Just, just fun stories that, that I've accumulated over the years. And that's kind of where work hard, don't suck came from. Yeah, that's awesome. I can't wait to grab that book. Ron also said he got to get that book. Um, and when you launch that book, let me know, I'm going to grab it. And I'm gonna push it out to my list because that I resonate with that. You know, I look yeah. man, my dad, man, you know, I hated him. I, I didn't hate him, but I disliked a lot of things until t at 25 when I decided to take responsibility. I was like, yo, my dad yeah. was the realest dude on earth. I just didn't know it. And at this yeah. moment now I can tell, you know. Yeah, well, you know, and that's that's part of the message in that is I think you know, I don't want to pick on any generation specifically, but I think the generations that are coming up recently, they're looking for an easy button. They're they're looking for they're looking for the get rich quick scheme or the six minute abs or or something like that. And man, unfortunately, that stuff just doesn't exist. The secret to life is work hard and try to suck a little bit less than you did yesterday. Yeah. That's I mean, it's really not cosmic. Now you can break these things down in the simplest processes, just like I did with the plan, posture, perform. That's very simple process. That doesn't mean it's easy. You know, you got to put in the work, you got to put in the effort. If you want a six foot trophy in your corner, you got to spend 20 hours a day watching game film, things yeah. like that. Yeah. Just be a good dude. I love that. I'm, I'm going to use that. Yeah. Just, just be a good dude. Um, simple. Gotta, gotta ask you which okay. favorite football team. Let's Alabama, go NFL Princeton. and college. Roll Tide. I, I really don't follow a, uh, a an NFL team. I, I kind of lost that when Brett Favre left the Packers. Yeah. I was a Brett Favre fan, and, and I kind of got into the Packers. And, and, you know, they were having some good days back then. Yeah. But I really enjoy watching individual players. Um, I've really watched – I've really enjoyed watching uh, Joe Burrow play, even though he went to LSU. I know. Yeah. But he's a he's a hell of a football player, man. I've loved watching Jalen Hurts' uh, character arc as he went from Bama to the bench yeah. to Oklahoma, and now he's – and now yeah. he's just crushing it in the NFL. I, I love to see those victory stories like that. Yeah, yeah I was so mad with Burrow. It was like, these referees not giving my boy a chance. <laughs> uh, I'm a Cowboy he, fan, but I love Burrow's, man. Yeah, well, I'm sorry you're a Cowboy fan. We can talk about that <laughs> off, off camera, but, you know, I'm sure God loves you anyway. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, all right, we're going to jump into the red zone. I'm going to ask you four fast-acting questions that I found that I, I just love to ask. These are just questions okay. I just love to ask. Are you ready? Go. All right. What's your favorite quote and why? Just be a good dude. Just be a good dude. Yeah. I think we, I think we talked about that a little bit. I think that yep. there's so much that's wrapped up in there. You know, my grandfather, my grandfather was a Southern, uh, Southern Baptist preacher and he, he really started, I think, um, instilling those character traits to just be a good dude. Yeah. And however you define that, you know, it's not up to me necessarily to define it. I can, I can, I can characterize that as, uh, being honest, having integrity, um, being disciplined. I, I think that those things make me a good dude. And that's the way I tried to bring up my kids. Yeah. That's amazing. That's awesome. What's your favorite book and why? Um, gosh, I have so many. Um, I'm really into, I, I, I've read uh, relentless by Tim Grover two or three times now. I, I think that that taught me a lot about myself and, and why I am the way I am. Yeah. But I go back to this one. It's called The Quantum and the Lotus. Um, I downloaded that randomly off of YouTube and, and I was in a kind of a low period of my life right after I'd retired. I kind of lost my why and my drive for a lot of things. When I lost, lost the military, I lost my reason to get up early in the morning and shave and, and keep my hair cut short and stay in shape. And I, I downloaded that book randomly off of a YouTube video, something like five books every man should read. Mm -hmm. And it sent me down so many, within 10 minutes, I had a, a notebook out taking notes on things to go and research and follow up on. And it really sent me down the path that I'm on now. That was that was kind of the, the first spark that got lit in me about two and a half years ago. So The Quantum and the Lotus, it's a good read. Yeah, that's awesome. 
if you could go back in time and talk to a 18 year old Paul, what would you tell him to accelerate you on your goals? Maybe not to accelerate, but definitely to, to take a different, a different arc is, mm -hmm. uh, I, I lost a lot of opportunities, I think because of attitude. Yeah. So I would, I would probably take, um, I would probably tell my 18 year old self to be humble, yeah. um, be, be kind, ask questions and start journaling. I think, I yeah. think that I would, I would go back and want to start some of that because as I've gotten older, I've, I've realized the value of going back and reading those lessons learned and, and being able to apply those. So hopefully you don't make the same mistakes twice. Yeah. That's awesome, man. That's awesome. Uh, last one. If you could have dinner with anyone who's ever lived in history, who would it be? And what would you ask them? Man. So I prepared for this. I was listening. I listened to a few of your episodes. Um, and I, and I knew that these questions were coming and I, and I know that Jesus is a real popular answer and, and Abraham Lincoln's probably a real popular answer, but man, I'm going to keep it close and I'm going to say my grandfather. Um, I lost my grandfather when I was 17 in high school and I hadn't hadn't quite fully developed and picked his brain enough yet. And and I think that I would really like to go back and ask him a few questions about what does it mean to you to be a good dude? And then do you think that I'm a good dude? Yeah. Yeah, yeah that, that's awesome. We had um, uh, Patty, Patty, I forget her last name, but she's she works over at Stanford and she broke down into tears and was like, I would just want to talk to my dad. And I think. Yeah. I think we all should, should interview our parents and our grandparents if we can. I can't wait to interview my dad. So that's that's really huge. Uh, yeah, that's Paul, a good is idea. There, is there, can you give us a nugget, uh, a, just a, a golden nugget that maybe a spark someone to get them to go do the shit that they know they need to do, make their common sense, their actual common practice, and, and, and get after it tomorrow or tonight? Well... So one of the first things that I tell, uh, tell the people in my circle and the, and the people that try to jump on my program is I want you to take off all your clothes and go stand in front of the mirror and just stare at yourself for 60 seconds. Yeah. If you, if you can do that, I, I guarantee you within 60 seconds, you're going to start to identify some things that you can work on, whether yeah. it's physical or, you know, maybe you didn't shave, maybe you need a haircut. Maybe you look at your midsection and you, you could, you could stand a trip or two to the gym. Or if you stare into your eyes long enough, I bet you you can get down in your soul and start asking yourself some of those questions. There's this really good poem out there called The Man in the Glass. And it's uh, basically the gist of the poem is the only person that you have to answer to ever is the guy staring back at you in the mirror. And if you can look that guy in the eyes at the end of the day and know that you did a good job and did everything that you were supposed to do, then I think you're doing good. Me personally, I look at that guy a lot and, and I see room for improvement. And that's what motivates me to get up and do it again the next day. Man, there it is. You guys heard him. Um, Paul, where can we come into your world? Where can we uh, wait for your book? Where can we follow you? Where can we dive into everything you do? Yeah, buddy. Go to my website. It's uh, paulroscoewhite.com. Uh, several tabs at the top. I got a little blog section. I just write kind of whatever comes to my mind on there. I've got the work hard, don't suck program that I'm putting together. And it's going to be a 30, 60, 90 day kind of get you off the couch and transform you into a champion type program. All my books are listed on there. And, uh, and the closest one that's coming up is going to be work hard, don't suck targeting uh, somewhere in April. Yep. There's my website there. You can check that out. And then on all the socials, so Facebook, Instagram, and uh, Indeed, or not indeed LinkedIn. Sorry. Uh, it's at Paul Roscoe white. Find me on there. Mm -hmm. All right. There it is. Thanks Paul for coming on. Thank you guys for tuning in live. I know we went a little bit late, but make sure you share comment and all that good stuff. It will be on every single platform that you can think of probably tomorrow morning, but still share the live. Hope you guys enjoyed this episode as much as we enjoyed making it for you. Till next time, peace. This is the Entrepreneur Underdog. Business secrets to help doubted entrepreneurs triumph. The Underdog Entrepreneur is where we use fast-acting shortcuts to help underdog entrepreneurs make more money, have a bigger impact, and live a better lifestyle so that they can prove their haters wrong. And now, your host, Roy Red. Roy Red.